Oh, the rain. I'll tell you what, this spring we've either had a lot of wind, a lot of rain, and a few nice sunny days in between. But for rebuilding an engine in a garage like this, you're much better with rain outside than a lot of wind. You don't want to be kicking up dust and this sort of stuff. Welcome to part four of the 351 Cleveland engine build. Now, I'm going to start with a little bit of a disclaimer here. My qualification is as a VACC mechanic. I am not an engine reconditioner. So as such, I'm doing stuff pertinent to me and what I know. I've asked lots and lots of questions in the past and the machine shop that I got this all done at, I asked more questions, which sort of reaffirmed what I already knew. Now, when you do this sort of stuff, make sure you ask lots of questions write them down at home as you think of them then you can go and ask the questions as you as you need to um, so in this chapter we're going to be rebuilding the engine block uh, fitting the rotating assembly and the camshaft i'm not going to be dialing the camshaft in this episode because i want to spend a bit of time on it and explain it um, and we're already up to half an hour just fitting the crankshaft the bearings the piston rings and of course that cam um, so sit back enjoy leave comments as you find necessary and I'll try and answer them as they come in. Thanks very much. And of course, today, yesterday, I went to reassemble this and I couldn't. And that was when at the end of the last video. Um, so today I've gone out and bought the correct rear main, which is the very last part I've bought, which is the very first part I needed to put it together. So I've got that now. That's the rigid two-piece type, not the rope type. I don't like those. And then of course, I've got my reading glasses, which are quite powerful, which means I can see because my, my eyes are not that good. And of course, they make my eyes look this big, which means I look like I'm off the front cover of Nerd Illustrated, but it doesn't matter. But at least I can see what I'm doing. So let's take the cover off and start putting it together. So there's a light breeze outside today. Um, a light breeze is okay, as long as it's not blowing a gale like it was the other day. And of course, we're not in an engine reconditioning room. We're in a garage, so I don't want too much wind. Um, not so much little fragments of airborne dust. It's things like concrete dust that blow up. That's really, really bad for something like this, but anyway, not to worry. Right, so the first thing we need to do is use a rag, a clean rag with thinners, and wipe out all of these areas here because we don't want to lubricate the back of the bearings. We want the front of them uh, lubricated. So these all need to be dry, all these areas here. And of course, I'll just dry up here as well. And I'm also going to clean and dry um, the bearing shells themselves on both um, sort of rear ends if you know what I mean. Now this is the rear main oil seal and it's got a sort of a pointed end on one side. Now if you put that this way with the pointed end facing the rear of the engine, oil is going to run straight past it so it needs to go that way so the oil can't get past. Now they also need to be staggered so they're sitting like that, and the reason for that is because you shouldn't really have the join level with these areas here. They need to be sort of offset like that. Now the other type of rear main oil seal, are these ones here, and there's three in here, there should only be two. These gasket kits I've bought, or the one I've bought, normally has a rope type with the rigid type as well. Now the problem with these, they seal quite well and they sort of squeeze into there. But the issue with them is, they tend to hang on to the crank, so the crank doesn't turn nice and smoothly. When we put that in, you'll see the crank will be very easy to turn. So any um, sort of, if it doesn't rotate perfectly smoothly, if there's any binding or any stiff spots in it, we abandon ship, take it straight back to the machine shop to figure out what's going on. It needs to be absolutely rotationally free. And of course, with these types of seals, the rigid type, which I've just shown you, they allow that to happen. And of course, here are the bearing shells I'm putting in. And again, I've wiped the back so they're nice and clean. I'm going to put the tongue in first, like that, and just sit him down into there. So they're level at both sides. They shouldn't be proud. They should be flush, just like that. Of course, the groove allows oil to come out. By contrast, the other surface is just plain straight. There's no groove there. If you put this in this side, you've seized your crank. Right, so it has to go in this way, obviously, for it to work properly. So we'll put the rest of the bearing shells in. Wiping each one, free of dirt on the rear face. And look, a little bit of uh, lubricant is going to seep under there. I've got to lubricate these bearings when I put the crankshaft in. But, um, 
you know, it's just a good thing. You don't lubricate the back of them. And the good thing about our Clevelands and most engines are like this, they're numbered. The bearing caps are all numbered um, and there's no, it's very hard to get them confused. So I'll clean all these up nicely. I'm not using gloves for this because I feel a bit better without them. Now you can use an assembly lube but you can also use normal engine oil which is what this is. Bearing in mind we're not going to be starting anything until we know unequivocally that we have oil pressure. So it's fine to use this here. The only part I'm going to use the grease on um, is the camshaft. You know the um, running in grease that goes on the the molly grease that sort of goes on the um, the lifter faces. So nice general amount of oil, and we can pop our crank in. These should be nice and free to turn. No binding. Lots of oil. There's plenty of oil there. There's plenty of oil there. That's cool. And then we'll just do them up with a speed brace and Bob's your uncle. Sometimes you'll feel a step as it um, as the caps bed into that rebate there. Like that. Right, so we're all torqued up. I've got this little socket, it's my brother's, and it just fits over the keyway. This is actually better on a windy than do a Cleveland. There we go. I can just use a mini breaker bar. It gives me feel. And that is perfect. Absolutely perfect. That's exactly how I want it. So now we can start putting pistons in. Right, I want to talk about piston rings and of course we're using molly rings. You can see this is the molly ring here, this is a cast ring and that's the second ring, that's the top one there. And they'll have an indicator which is top. So that's got a little dot there, I'm not sure if the camera can see that. So that signifies that it faces the top of the piston. This one on the other hand has nothing on it and it's just a rectangular section. So according to the leaflet, and it's always important to read these leaflets, this can go either way. Now it's reasonably unusual. Some of them have a, um, a radius cut into them, uh, sorry, a bevel cut into them. Some are rebated, and they, it, it's uh, sort of crucial that we get them in the right way. So if your eyesight's not much chop like mine, it isn't a bad idea to take a mobile phone in, get a couple of really good close-up photographs, although that's not that good, but we can see that there's no rebates or um, chamfers or anything like that in the ring. That's the top molly ring. And of course there were no dots either, so that can be fitted uh, upside down as well. Or it can be fitted either way around, I should say. Not a bad thing, because you don't want to make a silly mistake over something that's costing essentially thousands of dollars to do. Now, there's three important checks you need to do with piston rings before you stick them in the engine. And of course the first is the back clearance. So we stick it in the groove and we make sure it doesn't protrude from the edge of the piston. You can get a straight edge and shine a light through there to see if you can see light and that's one way of checking it and of course we need to do that for every ring in every groove this one sits back further you'll see there I'm not sure if you can see with this but anyway it is sitting back a little bit further and of course the oil rings go right the way in right the way into the groove but don't forget of course that this uh, spacer goes in first now of course we put the spacer in then we put the rings either side of that now it's important these things are butted together, they're not overlapped. That would be bad. 
and cause a lot of engine damage. It would actually be hard to do that. They'd be a really, really tight fit, so they need to butt together. Now, these instructions signify, or at least state, that each gap on the oar ring needs to be an inch either side of it. So the bottom one might be over here, the top one might be over here. And so we need to keep that in mind when we fit them on. Well, the second check we do is ring and gap. And of course, I'm just going to plop that ring in there, like that. Get our piston to square it up. And get a feeler gauge. Just check that. I'm on the wrong angle here. I'm going to double check it when I move the camera, and that's lovely. That's on 15. Um, now, that's important because um, when this thing heats up, obviously that gap's going to close up a little bit. And if they're too, that gap's too small, they're going to butt together, ruin the ball, and in some cases even flick up a little bit and can break the crown on the piston too. So that's most important we get that right. So I've got to check all of them. We just pull it out nice and square. Get the next one, check that too. I think I'm going to have to quit for today. The rain's too loud. The last measurement we want to do is the ring to piston clearance, which should be between two and four thousands. Now two thousands fits in there. That's all right. We go for the second one. And of course that will be all right because we just use an expander, but we're really looking at the compressor rings for that. Oops. Which, that is on 2000s, which is the sort of minimum thickness it's supposed to be. So that, that'll suffice, that's all right. All right, so we're starting to fit our rings. I've just lost, here we go. Now the expander is here, the top gap is there, so I might bring that round a little bit, it's a little bit too far away, and the bottom one is there, so it's, it's supposed to be an inch either side of where that expander is according to the instructions. Now that's your cast compression ring, your second ring there. You don't wind these on, you use a ring expander. They don't say anything about the molly rings having to use, having for you to use a ring expander, but this is all it is, it's just a sort of a a little plier and the piston ring can go on either way and we just open him up and put him in the groove like that and that's the safest way to do it and the reason for that of course is that if you wind them on which everyone does and I mean I've done that before as well if you wind them on you stand to put a wave in the ring and it won't wear evenly now I want to talk about clocking now we've got our oil ring set up and we need to talk about the thrust faces on the block and where the gaps need to be now when we talk about piston thrust, we talk about the natural inclination for it to kick over on its way down, major thrust, and then back again on the upward stroke, which is the minor thrust. So we don't want the gaps to be on the thrust faces of the block. So we want the gaps to be not on this way. We, won't, we don't want them in line there either because we don't want them in line with the pin, but we do want them to be diagonally across. So I'm going to have my oil ring set up on this angle and my compression ring set up on this angle. So they're 180 degrees apart, and they're not on the thrust faces, and they're not in line with the gudgeon pin or wrist pin. And of course, uh, you can see where the rods were resized because we've got these lovely ARP um, rod bolts, and we're just gonna clean that out because remember, we want that nice and dry, just with a rag and a little bit of thinners on there. And we're using cleavite bearings, so these are just straight bearings either side. I'm not going to lubricate them to begin with because I want um, I want to clearance them, of course. We want to put them in dry to clearance them. And again, it's the same as the others. You just pop it in. Just like that. And of course, to stop this crack, um, touching the crank, I'm just going to put a couple of bits of hose over there, just like that, uh, so that when we knock the piston down into the bore, there's no danger of that scraping up or scratching the crankshaft. And of course we have got the crankshaft set as far away from here as possible when we put the piston in. And of course I'm going to lubricate the piston. Um, fresh clean engine oil. That's all we need to use. And of course the other thing with this is, we can't sort of work the oil around like that because we're going to upset the way we've clocked our rings. Just sort of patting it around a bit. And of course, I'll go and stick a bunch of oil in the um, in the cylinder bore as well. And I reckon this thing sucks. So I haven't got a good um, ring compressor, which is pretty important. I'm just going to tighten this up, and of course, make sure it's nice and uh, 
level against the block. And then I'll guide just down the bottom. I'm going to stick my hand in here. And you're supposed to get it in in one hit. Now, I didn't. That's how you're supposed to do it. But of course, it's hard with a tool like that. Now, I'm just going to flick the engine upside down and we'll have a look. And this is the very reason why I use bits of hose just here. You can see it's touching the crankshaft. It's no big deal at all. Now, if that wasn't there, or there's no form of protection on there, I could really do a lot of damage to the crank. I'm just going to push that up like that. Um, and then pull these off. And of course, now it's all safe, you see. Now, there's one more thing I really want to make clear. And it's this. Now, I've seen machine shops make mistakes like this before. And there was one that made that mistake with my Windsor that I built for the XW. I can't see past the phone. Hang on a second, the camera. In here, at the edge of each of the journals is a radius. There and there. Well, you can't see it out of frame, but on the other journals as well. And here as well. And also behind there. Now, these things are cut with a chamfer in there. This side's straight cut. That's chamfered. Now, the reason for that is because that chamfer makes up for the radius on the journal. Now, if you get them the wrong way, or well, the machine shop fits the pistons the wrong way, we've got the big dish at the front, or what do you call it, the big mark at the front, which signifies front. If these are wrong, this clearance in here is going to be too fine, which means it'll seize. There has to be a certain amount of clearance between these big ends for oil to flow and to keep them cool. This is the hottest part of the engine. Aside from the exhaust valves, this is a really, really hot area. So that needs to be factored in when you're assembling these, and you need to keep an eye on it. I know this is it. This is right because I fitted it just before. The radius is on the outside. So the two radius on the outside and the two straight cut parts are on the inside there. And just like the crankshaft, these have all been measured professionally, but I've got a little bit of plastic gauge there so that when I put the um, cap on and torque it up, it'll get an indication of how how accurate that, this, that, that is now. This is a better way of seeing that chamfered edge. See that chamfered edge there? As opposed to that. I'll just take the bearing out. You can probably see it even better. Straight up to that edge. Chamfered on that. So that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. And I nearly got caught when I was young not doing the right thing with that. So, of course, the chamfered edge goes this way. And the easiest way with the Clevo is the numbers will all line up on the other side. We can pop him on. That plastic edge needs to be sort of in the centre part of the journal. Pop this on and I'll put these uh, nuts on and torque him up and take a reading. Now once that's done, if it's all good, which I'm assuming it will be, we undo the bearing, we take it off, we push the piston down a bit, lubricate underneath it, lubricate on top of it, the crank journal, everything, pop it back on, torque it and then we give it a rotate. Around about one and a half thousand. So we're good. We just have to clean that off. And we torque these up to 45 foot-pounds. Swing it around again. And now we need to take that measurement in there, that really, really important one. Just to make sure it's not too. You can see a little bit of movement there. That's good. We need to check it though. And that, uh, the book stipulates 10 to 20 thousands. And that's good. I've had them before, like the Windsor one. I didn't look at it carefully enough because I believed what the engine builder had done and fitted the pistons because the rods were the wrong way round. Didn't check it when I was putting it together and there was two thousands clearance. And I thought something's wrong here, pulled it apart and that's when I found it. I'm just glad I did. So that is a really, really important one. Don't get caught with that, whatever you do. And of course, once every piston's put in, we check for rotation. Again, we're looking for something nice and smooth as it rotates. Beautiful. Excellent. As I mentioned before, this is the, the number two I've just done. If, I don't know if I did mention this, you know if you haven't cleaned the block well enough, after you've rotated a piston up and down, if that's all grey, that oil there, but if it's nice and clean like that, you know the job's done. Hopefully you like my 2.9 litre V4. Beautiful.
Right, well, I've got the rotating assembly in. Everything's turning properly. Everything's torqued up. All the materials used up, all that sort of thing. I haven't thrown the boxes for bearings and rings out. I always cut the label off um, and stick it in the file so that I can always revert back and I know exactly what size everything was, what brand everything was, everything. I did the same with XW as well. And so I want to talk about the camshaft now. This is our comp cams. Um, stick, if you like. When it comes with a little bit of reading paraphernalia, which we're going to do, all the specifications there. Now this has a higher lift than standard, 510 and 526, I think standard's about 440 or 450 or something. So it's considerably larger than what the original one was. And of course it comes with a little thing of um, cam and lifter lubricant. We've also got this stuff here, which is the same sort of thing from ComCams, it's an old bottle of front. So we'll take it out, and we'll put it down gently. It hasn't got, yes it has got a dowel. Um, those dowels... Quite a lot. The Lunati ones come with two separate types of dowels. Now, the proper one I think sits in. Can I see that? Because I've got a habit of not showing this on camera. This camera's got a wider angle lens. The Lunati camshafts come with a shorter one and a longer one like that. Now, the longer one's fine, but there's a little, um, I don't know what you call it, a little protrusion on the back of the um, fuel pump drive that means that it sort of sits in to the sprocket a little way so that it always has that sort of grip, if you know what I mean. So it dries properly, which means this pin needs to be shorter. So I'm just going to put that down for a moment. Um, I think I've kept the one from the original camshaft. I've got to go through the box and have a look at some of the stuff I've got. So this is a two... What is this called? A 207, I think. Is that right? 265H, that's right. A 265, and that refers to its duration, I think. Um, I bought this a little while ago. Yeah, 265 on the intake. Uh, and 275 on the exhaust. So it's higher lift on the exhaust at 526 and the reason for that of course is the Cleveland's Achilles heel is its exhaust. So we'll have a look at that now. So I found a whole lot of rubbish here. Uh, we've got to clean some of these up. They're the camshaft thrust plates. Uh, if they're no good I'll check them out. If they're no good I'll just buy new ones. Um, that's an oil singer for behind the timing case oil seal. On the front of the crank that's the other pin i was talking about for the camshaft so i'll pull the uh, one out of the comp and i'll find i reckon that'll be shorter that one so i might use that and of course uh, fuel pump drive there's two of them there um, these things of course that's the oil pump drive shaft and they round off on the edges and of course i'm using this lovely arp one so it's much broader in the center section i imagine these would break somewhere in the middle if they were going to fail these ones most likely at the ends there but at the end of the day it's going to be an awful lot stronger it also comes with that little clip there and that's very important and we'll go into why uh, that all has to be set up properly afterwards now, this is a bit of a surprise i've got two thrust plates here this one's in far better condition that's actually perfect once that's cleaned up there's nowhere on that whatsoever but it's also got two little slots at the back now these normally go and i always sort of do this when i pull an engine apart this way in so that oil from the um coming out of the front cam bearing can be distributed around there this one's also got them on this side too and they're not directly adjacent they're sort of opposite so i'm going to use that one this one's not quite as nice um but i have to sort of run around with a razor blade just to make sure they're flat and there's no lip and they're, they're they're both flat they're both good i can't remember which one this one must have come out of the 351 that out of the junkyard engine but um I'm just going to just resurface them a little bit, just see how I go with that, but I reckon it'll be good. I'll just clean it up and see how I go with that, but I reckon I'm going to go with that one. But at the end of the day, I'm building two of these engines, so um, I've got sort of two of everything. If you know. I've even got three slingers. I don't know why I've got three, but I have. Um, of course, I'm not bothering cleaning up the bolt for the fuel pump eccentric because I've already got a new ARP one. So, I figured that'd be a nice thing to get. Just cleaning up one or two parts, and I've noticed one thing, and I noticed it before, actually, when I was cleaning bits and pieces of the block. There's brake clean and there's brake clean. This stuff's the CRC one. That's like 9 or 10 bucks a bottle or $8 or something. I can't remember. It's dear. This is the cheap stuff, 2 bucks or something from the reject shop. Don't use this one for inside your engine because it leaves a sort of a, um, a tanny cold residue behind. It's not clean. I was nowhere near as clean as that. The best thing to use, though, is just your normal GP thinners. 
and you can use just normal automatic thinner, general purpose thinner in a bottle, sort of like that. And you can sort of pump these up and shh, like that. They're pretty good. These are around twelve dollars at Bunnings. Um, and GP thinners. If you go to Milsom's in Furniture Gully and you've got an old can with you, it's only oh, I think about fifteen dollars to fill a four liter can. It's not much. Right. So when you get your can, you're going to get a big wad of bits and pieces like this. There's a little um. Talking about lubricants, that sort of thing. That's your spec sheet. You need that. Stick it to your toolbox or the back window. Um, common causes of failure, which is worth reading. And this is the one that you need to use. This is the camshaft insulation degreeing procedure. So we need to dial it in. And of course, we also have an MSDS, which talks a little bit about um, any things like this sort of stuff. How to treat yourself if you drink it and all that sort of stuff. And what its flashpoint is and all that. So I'm not worried about that. I'm not going to drink it. I'm not going to light it up with a cigarette lighter. But what I do want to do is I want to read this. Now, degreeing cams is degreeing cams. Once you've done them, it's easy to sort of forget bits and pieces. But this this tells you everything you need to know about it. Um, even lifter ball clearance. One and a half to two thousand lifter ball clearance. All sorts of stuff like that. Um, braking procedure. So it talks a little bit about flat tappets and dual valve springs and of course I've got to change my valve springs as well and there's even a braking procedure for those so we heat it up we don't rev it past 1500 revs or what is it 1800 revs or something um and let them cool properly and that sort of you know does them a bit of good it makes them last a long time so oh, checking it so I'm going to read all this valve lash we've got to look at all that this is the bit that takes the longest time Types of valve uh, springs, or what they mentioned about valve springs, there's everything in here. Um, piston to valve clearance is very important, particularly, um, let's say, they're saying 125,000. The rule of thumb is basically 100. That's 2.5 millimetres. Oh, here we go, and 125 in the exhaust. So this is a dual pattern, so that's what they're looking for. And the reason for that, of course, you don't want your valves hitting your pistons, but at full tilt, you get a bit of rod stretch and all this sort of stuff. And so we've got different pistons in with probably a different compression height. I know in the XW I went to a lot of um, trouble making damn sure that wasn't going to hit because I did raise the compression height because it was a smogger motor originally. Um, and they reduced the compression by having a huge amount of space above the piston, if you know what I mean, between that and the deck. So we've got to look at all this sort of stuff. Um, and it's really, really well worth having a good read of that but first I want to just install it so I'm going to look at this first part lubricating it and installing it um, and then we'll dial it in afterwards right here I just popped this pin out just to check it out it's the same length as the original one and now I know the Lunati ones they come in two different lengths and of course the longer of them stops that um, sort of spigot on the back of that sort of sitting in properly so it has to go into the other side of the timing gear so I'm just going to put that one back it was worth checking though well, I've got a camshaft out. I'm just checking the number on the back of it, just to make sure it marries up with that spec sheet on the off chance it was packaged incorrectly, but that's fine. It's the same one, so I know what I've got. And of course, I'm just going to put this tool in the back here. It'll just make handling it a bit easier. I think I mentioned this in the other one where I was checking rotation. So that just goes in. And of course, not just for installing it, but lubricating it with that molly grease that it's provided with. It just means I can handle it so much easier. Right, so on the lobes we're going to put this stuff and on the journals we're just using normal engine oil. So I'm just going to cut that off. And it should... Oh, here we go. Oh, it's this stuff. I've already got some of that. I thought this was the molly based stuff. Anyway, we're going to put some of this goopy stuff on each lobe. I thought this was the other stuff. I've already got an open jar of this. The Linetti came with a sort of a molly based grease. Let's get it all over and we'll rub it around. If I run short of it, I've got that other bottle there. So I'm just going to go around. This is super goopy, sticky stuff and it doesn't wash off easily um, when you put it on. So that's the idea of it, of course, that we don't lose it straight away. And it gives it some sort of protection. Um, I'm going to spot a bother here. 
No, no, no. I need the camera moved. Because <laughs> I can't touch one. Alright, so, hopefully I'll stick a bit of engine oil here. On the ends, on the journals. Run that around. Can you grab the camera and just... Can you just bring it over here? Just around this side. Around here, Sage. No, around here. <laughs> what I'm doing. Can you see where I'm putting it in here? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. <gasps> okay, cool. Just got to get it so gently in. There we go. She's home. Wonderful. Nice and cream. We've already checked the rotation of it, so we know it's all good. I've got to bang this thrust plate on now. And it's a bit of a pain because I've got to put a bit of I've got to put a bit of Loctite on the bolts. And these little bolt here, quarter inch ones, are torqued to something like twelve foot pounds. So I'm just going to do it with my ratchet for now I'm just going to put some on there I've cleaned all these up in thinner so it should be good and after I've done that we have to put that goopy stuff on here again now this is the one that has the grooves on either side so that's the outside one some engine Chevy small box I think use a Torrington bearing a roller type one but this one doesn't just use it like a thrust plate type arrangement some stuff around here just to protect it and it goes like that. So I'm just going to get those bolts and stick them in. And those threads are cleaned out. And we clean the bolts in thinner. I'll put a little bit of Loctite on. And I'm doing this left handed. I'm the right handed person so it's hard for me. Here we go. Here we go. And then of course we'll whack this one on too. Slide out. I'm doing anything sinister like that. So it's all locked in beautifully and lubricated. Whoops. So... We're now in a position where we can start the process of dialing it in. Which is a good thing. So I'm just going to get the torque wrench. Whoa! I'm just going to get the torque wrench and tighten these up. That feels like about 12 there, but I will check it. Of course, I have been uh, part shopping. I've got the last couple of pieces I need to put the short engine together and of course one of them is a new balance and if you look at this old one it's not too bad in terms of the rubber around here these tend to stick out uh, after some time which means they're absolutely knackered but this one's not too bad it just looks a bit mangy the machine surface there's a bit grungy and all that sort of stuff so I bought this standard replacement you can pay a lot of money for a balance you can pay 400 bucks for one this is just a standard replacement one I'd like to um run a bit of white paint over that then wipe it off to see these sort of increments but I reckon if I do that all that will smudge off anyway so I'm going to highlight some of the um, significant ones of course this is new yeah thanks very much for watching this uh, this installment but I do want to revisit this balancer thing just quickly here's the new one and this is of course is the absolutely manky one I was talking about before now I had a closer look at that and realized that it is actually really serviceable. Now this took about five minutes to clean up with a bit of scotch pride around here. And I threw it in the um, parts wash at work and gave it a $3 rattle can finish. Now it isn't, it isn't perfect by any stretch, but at the end of the day, it is an original part. And if those lines, uh, timing marks line up properly, I'm going to keep this for my second 351 that I'm building uh, after I've finished this car, or at least while toward the end of building this car. Now the original budget I suppose I came up with for this car was about $15,000. Now I didn't think I'd do it uh, as well as what the XW had and the XW is this thing behind it. I didn't think I'd do it to the standard that I did that but I actually want it better. The XW has got imperfections in it and every car is going to but I've changed my mind and I want this to be better. I want it to be finished better and I want it to look better. Now it's too easy to get carried away buying new parts and sometimes you just don't need to. And of course that wiper mode is a perfect example of something that looked pretty ratty but ran really really well or operated really well and I gave it a, a bit of a paint job. Now you can buy uh, reconditioned ones online for nearly $300. That cost me 
25 bucks. And of course, this suspension arm is another example. This is the original part that's been blasted and powder coated and fitted with new bearings and ball joints. And it ended up being far cheaper uh, than buying a, a set of repro ones. Of course, that lower arm is a, is a reproduction one. I didn't want to use the original one because it had been sort of, I don't know, belted around a little bit. But all these parts here, the backing plates, all these sorts of parts, of course, are the original, except the springs and the spring saddles. And of course, the engine's back to bed, and we'll get into dialing in the camshaft on the weekend. Uh, of course, it's Friday night now, it's a bit wet and cold, so I'll go in and I'll edit this and sort of put it all together and try and post it tonight. But uh, I should have the next one up in about a week or so. Anyway, drive safely, enjoy your classic, and I'll see you later. Ta-da!